have an MA in Archaeology from UCD in Dublin and today I'm going to be looking at the treatment of the animal dead under the heading diversity in human animal burials. Specifically I'm going to expand on what little diversity there is in the interpretation of animal burial and human animal burial. The aim of this presentation is mainly to Paul, you're muted. Saying, which was, it is the duty and burden of mankind, first to go to church, then to go to war, and finally, if you're lucky, to go home. So with that in mind, we're going to look at animal burial in a religious context, in war burials, and in a more domestic setting, with one or two case studies for each section. This is my first time presenting with no audience, so please forgive me if I come across as a little bit insincere or artificial in any way. I will do my best to sound genuine whilst directly into the void. So without further ado, let's go to church. Much of the archaeological record concerning animals in religious practices pertains specifically to animal sacrifice, the animal being used as a tool for the human subjects to gain favour with the deity, spirits, ancestors, or some form of a higher power. And while the word sacrifice in the phrase animal sacrifice implies that the animal had some level of value to the human, the animal in this case is always ultimately an unwilling accessory to human motives. However, there's another perspective in antiquity wherein the animal itself was worshipped as a deity. And that's the one that we'll be looking at today. The cult of the Apis bull in Memphis, Egypt, is recorded as having begun as early as the first dynasty period. The Apis was thought to be a living incarnation of the god Ta, the creator of all things, including some of the other creator gods. Ta ultimately developed into the god of craftspeople and architects, though he maintained his status as one of the key figureheads in the Egyptian pantheon. The two illustrations on the right are both from the 18th dynasty period. The upper image is an illustration of a wall painting at Tomb D in Memphis, and the lower depicts an Apis illustration on a coffin footboard. The upper image depicts an Apis facing a pile of food offerings with deity figures in front and behind. The Apis bull itself was said to be locked in a reincarnation cycle. When one incarnation died, either from natural causes or from being ceremonially executed at 25, the next was identified by its markings and colorings. Both images here depict the animal with black and white coloring and a decorative red rectangle on the flank. It has been suggested that the gray coloring of its horns, more clearly visible in the colored image, may indicate that the animal wore silver sheaths. During and after the 18th dynasty period, Apis bulls were always mummified and are described as having been, quote, buried in splendor with tombs rich in grave goods. However, there's little evidence of animal burial in Apis tombs before this period. This has been attributed by some to a phenomenon which is referred to in the ancient pyramid text. Specifically, the cannibal hymn. This passage described how the deceased king would hunt, slaughter, and devour the gods who manifested as sacrificial bulls in order to, quote, take on their powers. While most pre-18th dynasty Apis tombs did not contain mummified bulls, many tombs did possess decorated pots, which contained fragmentary and cremated cattle bones, the implication being that upon its death, the priests attending the Apis bull would cook and consume its body as a form of worship extending beyond the physical world. While there is no obvious explanation for the sudden change in mortuary rituals during the 18th dynasty period, the cattle remains from the earlier tombs do open up the possibility for new interpretations. Specifically, that animals whose remains previously suggested sacrifice and butchery may have actually been worshipped as gods during their lifetime. We've attended church, and now we move along to war. Horses are the animals most often associated with war burials and warriors' graves. Their importance in war likely stemmed from their utility in transport and physical prowess, 
but we will explore how their identity expanded far beyond that. These next two case studies from either side of the world are both from the Iron Age. We will look at one burial which was rich in grave goods and one which was hardly furnished at all. And though their dressings and locations are quite different, the horses in these examples are similar in their apparent importance in their respective communities. A 2,300 year old soldier's grave in Pazarik was shared by a single human male and 10 horses. Each horse possessed a variety of objects like saddles, pendants, and tassels. The grave goods associated with the horses, all of which were quite ornate, were unique to each animal. The grave goods seemed to reflect individual characteristics, such as age, abilities, and personal accomplishments, with the oldest of the 10 possessing the greatest elaboration of all. The individuality of the possessions buried with the horses indicates that each horse had established a personal history and identity during its lifetime. While the classic interpretations of this type of human animal shared grave would view the horses as exclusively belonging to the human, this example in particular could be interpreted a little bit differently. The horses were indeed buried with the human, but if we reverse the perspective, the human was buried with the horses as well. These animals had identities and qualities independent of this man. While their shared grave clearly demonstrates that at least part of their ontology is formed by their relationship with him, their unique ornamentation and richly decorated grave suggest that their individual identities were not purely relational. Equally, it's important to note that a significant part of the man's identity must have been relational to these specific horses. After all, they're sharing a grave. This example shows that these animals were viewed as important members of their society and deserve respect in death as much as any human. Horse burials in particular were quite common in societies wherein horses were multifunctional as a means of transport, food, companionship, and symbols of social status. However, like humans, the degree to which their graves were furnished varies drastically case by case. An Iron Age cemetery in Sedgford contained a variety of inhumations and cremated remains, both horse and human. Many of the graves contained full or articulations alongside the horse remains, suggesting that horse sacrifice was common practice here. Written accounts from this period confirm that the elite warrior class were often buried alongside their horses, and partial horse remains in a grave were a symbol of elevated social status. However, one burial in this cemetery stands out. It was that of a single eight-year-old male horse. The animal was near complete with no obvious pathology other than a fracture of the nasal bones, which seems to have come from the strike of a sharp, heavy object, possibly an ax. This horse was unique, not only in its apparent solitude in the grave, but also in its positioning while many of the shared human horse graves in this cemetery positioned the human resting on an upright recumbent horse, this animal was placed in the fetal position with its head resting on its shoulder. In addition to this, there is evidence that the horse was buried under a mound, a unique feature in this particular cemetery. An accurate carbon 14 date could not be reached due to the decay of the bones, but the fill in which the animal was found contained pottery from the late Iron Age and the early Saxon period. One author suggested that the grave of this complete horse demonstrated sacrifice, stating that the intentional killing of this animal was, quote, probably aimed at ensuring fertility or possibly battle success and honoring the gods, spirits, ancestors, or combinations of all or any of these motives. While this interpretation is certainly plausible, albeit somewhat vague, Another key possibility is offered here, that the loss of this horse may have been the result of an accident or battle injury. This individual was clearly given special treatment as it was buried alone, positioned uniquely in the grave, and was given a burial mound, an honor which was not apparently afforded to any of the humans in the cemetery. We have made it through the trials of war, and it's finally time to go Dogs are one of the earliest domesticated animals in human history, and one of the most commonly represented species in human animal burials. 
our relationship with them seems to be universal, with dogs having been domesticated repeatedly and independently across the continents throughout prehistory. The often ritualistic nature of their burials indicates that their identities in life spanned far beyond the imagined confines of utility. In the ancient world, the lines between pet, guard dog and hunting dog were sometimes blurred, but this next site contained dog burials in which the roles of these animals were clearly differentiated in death. Skate Home 1 and 2 in Sweden contained several richly decorated human animal burials. Many of the human animal combined burials from this site were that of dogs and children. While the single, dog, single child and dog child burials all appeared in human burial grounds, at Skate Home 2 they were placed in different areas of the site. Dogs were positioned on the eastern and western boundaries while children under eight years of age were located at the north and south. This could indicate that both dogs and children were viewed qualitatively as belonging to a different category of personhood than adult humans, but were viewed as persons nonetheless. Over in Skate Home 1, one dog in particular was buried alone. Its grave contained flint blades and red deer antlers. These objects would typically be associated with the burial of a human male at this time, and unless the people of Skate Home knew something that we don't, we can assume the dogs can't actually use flint blades. This indicates that the dog had formed a unique social identity during its life as a hunter, and the clearly symbolic grave goods demonstrate the considerable importance of its role for the people who buried the animal. While these examples show the veneration and appreciation shown to some dogs, others met a less favorable end. At Skate Home 1 and 2, there was considerable diversity in the circumstances of death and the post-mortem treatment of dogs. Some were killed violently, while others seemed to die of natural causes. Equally, some were buried with a considerable amount of grave goods, and some were buried with none. These examples could mean that dogs were even more similar to humans, and that they were as diverse in social roles, identities, and relationships as humans. And so to summarize, these examples have shown how important it is for us to challenge our anthropocentric biases and reconsider how we view human animal relationships in the context of death and burial. The examples here were all of domesticated pack animals, a category under which humans arguably fall. So it should be of no surprise that these animals are represented so frequently in human animal burials. And finally, the tendency to assume that animals who died of artificial causes were sacrificed is no longer sufficient in the archaeological interpretations of animal burial, and we need to delve deeper into the rich diversity of our long-standing and indelible relationships with animals. Thank you so, so much for listening. I really hope that you gained something useful, or at least maybe a little bit entertaining out of that. Um, please enjoy these pictures of my own animals, um, they're all terribly stupid, but I love them dearly and I would die for all of them. Uh, thank you again so, so much.